So, um, I would like to welcome Nikki to Back to International Day of the Midwife. She is a lovely midwife working in rural London in New Zealand. And uh, she's going to talk about some of the challenges and the joys of working in a remote location. So thank you for coming, Nikki. And um, I think it's a particularly relevant topic at the moment in New Zealand, as we've lost many of our rural community health services, and I'm sure many people can relate. So um, I'm looking forward to your presentation and the discussion after. OK, this is me. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm actually working in a little um, beautiful place in the southern part of New Zealand, in the Fjordland. And this first photograph is actually just taken from my window at home. And that over there that you can see is Lake Piano. Um, yeah, rural midwifery, goodness me. But for, for me, rural midwifery really means um, um, it just sort of upholds the whole philosophy of what the midwifery profession is about. Um, and it just reflects that whole principle of, that we all work with and the who of, you know, primary health care for the vast majority of women who are sick and healthy. Um, um, yeah, as they start their journey towards their parents. You know, for me, um, primary care just means that looking at the women who and sharing with them with their pregnancy about um, what what is a normal healthy process of life? Okay, so we just so, so if you if for people who don't know where we are, we're right down the bottom of the world here, which is New Zealand. Um, this little red square down here that just shows you in the South Island. We've got two islands in New Zealand. People may have heard of Auckland at the top there, Wellington, Christchurch, and little old Dunedin down there. They're the main centres. They carry big tertiary units. The little mark down the bottom there that's in the cargo, that's a secondary unit, so we can do cesarean care. And then we're just coming into this next part, shows the area that um, little Lumsden sits here, that's a little primary unit there, and we have women in that area. And when we added it up, we were quite shocked that it's covered 8,200 people. So you need a good car, and you need a cell phone. However, there's lots of areas that don't get covered by. Um, and I, the, the little unit that I work at is at London, and I actually live in Tiana. So the women that um, live in Tiana, Tiana's got about two and a half thousand population. And the living, women that live in Tiana um, then drive to London to have their babies. So I live in Tiana, so I can run um, regular clinics here and do all the postnatal care here without huge mileage. Um, and then, um, yeah, when we go into labour women from Piano, I myself drive to London, which is about 78 kilometres. Um, and then the other midwife, Michelle Scott, who's my teammate, she is based in London. She actually has a little flat at the unit, and um, we back each other up each the She has her own caseload, and I have my own caseload. Okay, maternity services in New Zealand. Well, basically how it's funded by the government. Um, every single woman in New Zealand who becomes pregnant attracts a, a funding to herself that covers primary care and secondary care. So primary care being anything that a um, normal healthy woman and a pregnancy. And secondary care is attached to her also in case she needs to access um, secondary services that would be any referral we made to to a, con a consultant obstetrician or a pediatrician or any reason that her pregnancy isn't going well or has um, complications, that funding is then paid for by hospitals. Um, there's some, some issues that you know we all face about that, but that's how it is. Um, LMC here stands for Lead Maternity Carer. That's um, anybody who can provide full service to these um, women who are pregnant. Um, and that can be either a midwife or a GP if he's got his um, diploma in obstetrics or um, consultant. And we claim for each trimester, so the first, second and third trimester. Then the labour and birth has a big payout and then up to six weeks postnatal care. So the women get to know us really well um, if you're following them right from booking, which we do at about between eight and ten weeks most, most of the time. 
and then that takes you through right through to six weeks after the baby. And this is our little unit. This is Lim's maternity on the front gate. Um, this, it's been there for a long, long time as a, as a maternity hospital. And about 15 years ago when lots of changes were going on, the community around the area decided that they really wanted to keep midwifery um, a midwifery centre and maternity centre at the unit uh, in the Lumsden. Um, so attached to this um, fly unit is a little medical centre that um, is run by one GP there. Um, but he doesn't have anything to do with the maternity centre. He's not connected to us at all. Um, yeah, so just to go over that primary care again. Um, primary care, we all know, is recognised as the monitoring of the woman and her baby through the pregnancy, sharing information to encourage good decision making and um, regarding how she, how her lifestyle is, where she wants to birth, and the preparation of becoming a mother. And, and, and I've been, you know, preparation and believing that women are here to do the job of having babies. And, and it, you know, it's a good job we have such a good time with them. Because um, I think a lot of women now feel that they've got, they can hand over that care or somebody will take control of it for them. And it's, you know, you, you do have to build a good relationship with them. Give that power back to them, that control back to them. Nobody's going to make them to live anywhere. So women have to choose birth at London. They are often, you know, if they don't want, if they want to go to a hospital to birth, they can travel to Indicati. But from um, Tiana, that's about a two-hour journey. So Lumsden itself is about an hour from Indicati, so we kind of look at it as a halfway point. And then secondary care is recognised as the referral of women to a specialist care in a hospital for consultation, treatment complications occurring either for the mother or the baby. Um, I just thought I'd put this little slide and show you, you know, that difference between primary and secondary units in the region. Um, as you can see, the little red dot, um, Lemmerson is sitting there um, as a little primary unit. We have a little unit in Tuatakri, another unit in Winton and Gore, um, and Frankton, is, which is in Queenstown, which a lot of people might have heard of. It's a big tourist town. And they've got a small unit there. The Invercargill's got a blue dot. That's a secondary unit, so they can do Today, infections and, and problems, and then the leading is the tertiary unit where more complicated infections can go from anywhere in the region. So, a schedule practice really for me um, is including the promotion and facilitation of the physiological process of pregnancy and childbirth. So in other words, letting women recognise that there is a normal process to do it. Um, and I need to have the knowledge and the ability to identify anything that goes outside the normal. And that's my job. I'm a, that's what I do. I share that with women. I, we, I see them regularly. I, um, they get to trust what, what I tell them. Um, and then we, we assess for any um, appropriate level of specialist assistance or we couldn't do our job as a rule yet ever without um, the obstetricians, the pediatricians, the need for sitting, waiting for us to come in with any complications. Hmm. Yeah, big area to cover. And living and working in such a huge area means we are absolutely blessed with the women who live here who understand that word distance. They um, they are very very good to us. They and we're, we're very clear with our boundaries too. You know we can't be running out to see that everybody all the time. They understand that our priority has to be women who are presenting um, in labour at our primary unit, um, and they understand that um, it's safer to have two midwives present at that. So you know the boundaries that we set are very very clear. They, um, they have access to us by cell phone, but they also understand that if they're out, out of coverage, which happens in and out all the time, that um, we will get back to them all the time. They tend not to win us for a bit serious. They, they see us regularly enough that they know that they can talk to us then. 
Um, and yeah, they understand that, you know, I'll be there in an hour. Or, you know. We do offer continuity of care, um, that's one to one midwife woman relationship. Um, um, and because how we, we organise the, the care, so Michelle, who's based at London, sees the women that are living in that area regularly. We start book, uh, booking from between 8 and 10 weeks. And then we see them every four weeks at 28 weeks of pregnancy. After that, we see them every two weeks, up to 36 weeks, and then we get up to every week. Um, and amongst that time, we do try and arrange that the women from Tiana will come over to London at some point in the pregnancy, that later pregnancy, and meet with, with themselves. And we also have another midwife, um, Kate Bentley, who lives in Dunedin and travels down Every fortnight she comes on a Thursday and then um, covers us for a weekend off. So the women, we try and get them to come on a Thursday now. Um, information sharing, information sharing is, um, is what this is all about. Um, you have to talk to women um, and they have to feel comfortable with you to share information. And you know, each, each, um, that we have with them, we build on the relationship that we've had before. We have a um, we have um, women held notes; they carry their own notes. Um, we write in there; they can write in them anything that's happened to them in between times when we haven't seen them. And if they need to be um, seen by a consultant or a pediatrician, they have those notes with them with all their results, their scan results, and the information that they've been shared from me. Um, is available for them to take with them. And um, we do, we tailor the, the needs of each woman to the appropriate level of care that they require. Some women are very motivated, they come back to me with all sorts of weird and wonderful great things that I keep going, well, that would be good. And we talk about, um, we just discuss the level where they want to be. Some women, you know, absolutely adamant want to be down at the um, secondary hospital. So all individual tailored really beautiful photograph taken from the checker. Piano. Yeah, back to basics. That's what being a rural midwife is all about. You have to know the basics. Um, we need to know that women are um, healthy and fit. We use our hands, our eyes, our ears and our tongue. Build on those regular visits and um, with all the previous information they've shared with us. And we make assessments of mother's physical well being um, and measure that growing uterus to make sure that everything's going well. And we offer um, appropriate scans for the antenatal blood work that we do, especially with the iron levels in schools. Um, we do um, run some antenatal classes about three times a year at London. Um, so a lot of women sign up for that. Um, I have to say, as a midwife, I don't dwell too much on the craft. That's the antenatal educators. And I also spend a lot of time reassuring women that actually when you have your baby, that's the best time to learn how to change your it's much much easier when you have to have when you have to and babies um, at each visit um, you know you could call it routine check I like to say that I'm doing a full check of the mother check of blood pressure regularly we do a urine sample measuring the picture Looking at the fetal heart, discussing women movements, discussing women issues that are arising for them, we discuss um, all those things that we do with all the time: diet, smoking, etc. Um, here's a lovely little picture of our little birthing room at Lumsden. 
Like the bed looks like it dominates the place, but it doesn't. You don't use it very often. And that's why it's got this nice thing. Seems to get pushed around the room a little bit. It's dark in the background. That's the We call it the lemon filigree drawer. Just to the side there where that blue drawer is, that's a little ensuite bathroom with a shower in the toilet. And a little alcove here that you can't see. That just has some cupboards in there with the basic equipment that we might require and emergency IV trolley. And that's it. Um, we do have a receptive pair that um, we put into the room where we do. Just get set to it from where that I'm from. Take that part of it. Yeah, information shared with the woman. I think we've talked a little bit about that, but it is about sharing and building knowledge that strengthens each relationship. Um, and I don't ever, um, you know, I do believe that, you know, the discussion has to happen. They have to understand why we're doing them and how those tests are going to, and what results we'll get from them. And what will it take? All the women have all the copies of all their results, and I make sure that they understand them when they arrive. And it just, you know, it just makes sure that both the midwife and the mother get to make sound clinical decisions and, and choices. Um, we talk a lot about in New Zealand about um, informed consent, and um, and that means for everything. We discuss vitamin K. We discuss um, whether we're going to use and it's bollocks in the third stage. We discuss in skin, we discuss everything that's going to happen around that, that building. So little babies, they in the way. At the unit at Lumsden, we have three postnatal rooms. Um, so I've got lovely big double beds and on street um, bathrooms for everybody. And these are our little cops, so we must have a full house, but there's three babies here. Hmm. And this is the order sewing of our beautiful linen there. Okay, so looking after women. Um, and we're sure that everything's well and healthy. But um, that's the basics. You have to recognise the flag of when something's not right. The rule of midwife, I think that's one of the things I've learned very quickly, is that um, you, know, you can't just pop out the door and say, you can become a little bit. It is about identifying warning and marker signs that things may be going to awry and acting on them. Um, it is acute awareness and availability of, of any specialist medical help. Um, we do work under strict guidelines of um, what we call Section 88. It's very detailed and comprehensive, and it pays to make the referral. And sometimes you do have to be a bit pushy. Your lady can't be seen for 10 days. She's no social clinic, so that can be difficult. And also, we do have this constant awareness of our local weather conditions. Um, just for instance, tonight Michelle was going to join me um, to, to, to visit her group. Um, yesterday we had 15 degrees down here in Tiana. Today it's 3 degrees. And we've got snow on the top. <laughs> so I decided that perhaps it wasn't a good time to come over and chat on the computer. We'd have to get back to London. So being very aware of the local weather. Um, one good thing in our favour is that there is only one road in and one road out of Tiana. It's a bit of a dead end trail. Most people go on to Milford Sand and then they have to turn around and come back. So local road people want to keep it open. Lots and lots of people come to Milford Queenstown, buses and tourists. It is very well maintained. I think in all the years I've been here, it's just five years altogether. I've had one day. And then if I'd needed to go, I would have got to turn around and agree to And even then it was open on the train. Um, you also have to be a bit aware of availability of um, emergency services and um, access to immediately back up. Um, Michelle and I back each other at Fergie Booth. Um, Kate, when she's coming on the weekend, make sure that she has um, our nurses that um, 
put a bit um, unit, then we had women playing personally. A lot of them been around a long, long time. They're very happy to be Would you like to have two people there at the time? Um, obviously, sometimes you get called out. Um, the emergency services availability, you think that, yeah, it's just an ambulance, but um, even at Lumsden there, uh, we have a local ambulance sitting there, a roster, they're getting very full of volunteers, and sometimes they just cannot provide us with uh, an ambulance straight away. So sometimes when you're ringing for one, you may have to wait for one to call from Gould, or even from Invercargill, which, which can take up to 45 minutes to get we do. We are very lucky in Tiana that we have a fantastic um, helicopter emergency service, and we do have a big medical centre here that's got at least five doctors, um, and we do have quite a big ambulance service here. They are here for the tourists a lot of the time. Um, so really, if you get really, really stuck, we do the, um, the helicopters will come. But we do have to um, talk to the hospital to request a helicopter. Um, and in all the times I'm touching with you, in all the time that I've been here at Lumsden, um, there's only been a helicopter required once, and that was for a very severe postpartum hemorrhage for a lady who had a um, simple procedure. Um, and I have to say I wasn't here for that in the time. for that, and had to go in the helicopter that arrived from Tiana with a CP on board. I'm on the lady lost over two and a half thousand more and was very um, compromised. Yeah. She um, came back and had another baby with us two years later. It was a normal birth. Very grateful that we were, and it was a, ter it was a terrible night, that was one of those nights. And in the middle of winter, we had the police had actually closed the main road and took all the ice, the black ice. And then when we rang, saying we were in a desperate state, they didn't want the ambulance to come up the road. It was just one of those hideous nights. But we did get the helicopter and we got to the car. Yeah, <laughs> I'll come back to that for a minute. <clears throat> Midwives, um, we do assist women to birth in a primary setting that has to mean that women are well and have an uncomplicated pregnancy and understand the normal physiological process of labour. We do spend quite some time going through what is going to happen in labour. We talk about the mechanism. I demonstrate the model. Um, we talk to the husband too. We have a labour and birth discussion. They come to the unit. They look at the birth unit. They know that um, we don't have epidurals or what else really apart from the Panadol and the water and movement matters. Um, the, the most transfers that we get out of Lumsden are for women who usually um, are first time mothers who are very excited about the first contraction and tend to work hard all night and take them a while to get to get to four centimeters. You feel a bit worn out and then um, they go on and things slow down and they do the chance of that. Um, a timely transfer of second services, I've just talked about that sometimes the difficulty about getting an ambulance. But if all goes well, um, we can call the ambulance if it's local, it comes and we can be down and in the car with it. It's quite uncomfortable for women, especially if they're in the later stages of labour. Um, we always have a midwife travel in the ambulance, and the other midwife usually comes to find the car. Just in case you have to go the other way. Yeah, that hasn't happened yet. I'll just go back to that previous um, little slide. I'm just showing you this one here, because this was an unexpected birth at London. This is a wonderful woman called Tiffany, with her daughter Selena there, and the Jim Jams, and her husband Bruce. We're standing at the back there and we fell with the blood still and we just had to um, We planned this, this pregnancy from the start to birth at the end of the cargo. Um, that's the um, baby, And on the day that she went into labor, it was early in the, in the hours of the morning, she rang me and went round to her house, we called the ambulance. Everybody knew I'd spoken to the ambulance people. 
I never have God. I wouldn't want to go smoothly until we got about 30 minutes into the journey. Bearing in mind we were heading to the We were on top of the gorge hill and she was hanging on to the bars above her and she to me in the ambulance her husband was following in the car. And she had thought that we were going to make it. That was a nice big breath I took. Quickly ran Michelle, who had been involved in another birth at Lumsden. He was just transferring that lady down because she um, required augmentation, hadn't been doing it. Quickly cleaned up the delivery room and we diverted from Lumsden. Our biggest scare was that Bruce coming behind, we couldn't get him on his cell phone because he'd gone out of trouble. We did get the message. We arrived at the unit and we had lady number one. Very happy that we could sort of take that. Michelle was just wrapped into the first clean birth. She didn't want to bring up her face to come to Me, I'm looking at Riva. I don't know if there, but I have to say Riva that we were pumped. Um, Well, I've finally transferred second skills and practicing your emergency skills. Um, the, the New Zealand um, Medicine Council are competencies for practice. We do have to attend every two years a uh, or technical skills groups, but where part of that technical skills always is to do the unexpected deep birth, the shoulder dystocia. And I have to say, as a rural midwife, you never know what's going on. Um, but if you know how to deal with that, then it happens. It just happens. This lady here, beautiful Rory, who looks like he's fast asleep and not particularly interested in what's going on. This is Paula and Eric. Paula's one of our local GPs. This is her third baby. She went 10 days over to and was due to go down to the cargo for an induction, which she was very disgusted about because she had a beautiful birth with her second child, Roy with her third child. So she's getting a little bit disgruntled. So the night before she was due to go into Cargill, I said to her, go to the Lumsden. There was nobody in. So her and her husband spent on one night at the Hotel Lumsden. And she managed to get herself into labour. Um, so at um, 8 o'clock that morning, we um, had some lovely regular contraction, sent out for a big walk. While she was going around the block, she had to have a pee, so she squatted in the bushes and had a pee and felt that baby's head bonk down into her car as she came back up. Her water's broke and within 40 minutes we had um, Rory's head popping out and then we realised that Rory's shoulders weren't going to come. So, you know, well, she was in the bath, we just popped her out um, onto the bed, leg over, moved her about three times. Rory so she's a very happy GP. Um, with the beautiful Rory, who's one of the sweetest kids you've ever seen. Brilliant. And this is Kate. This is our third midwife who comes to relieve us. We couldn't do our job without Kate. Being a rural midwife, you have to have regular time off. It's absolutely vital. We, um, when we didn't have anybody to come and cover us, it's very hard to be just one midwife on, one midwife off all the time. It's just, it's just lovely to have know that Kate comes and Kate's been a midwife as long as I have. She's also trained in the UK. She's been a midwife 30 years and nothing plays with Kate. Bit of a character. Everything to please and yeah. Her fitness, she's awesome. She's standing there with our lovely old resuscitator. We have just done some fundraising and have got some great um, new equipment to install, but this is what gets wheeled in and it gets taken out the way you can't see it. Um, documentation, my goodness me, I sound like a teacher now. Document is absolutely about you. You have to write down what you've discussed with them. They hold their own notes, all discussions, and the decisions made with the woman needs to be recorded. Um, we retain, as midwives, we retain a copy of exactly what's in their book, all the test results, all the scans, all the history. We are a, a risk averse society and have the need to control everything which we encounter. And that's hard. We can't control things. 
not one of those things you can control. So you need vigilance, you need discussion and monitoring, and that mitigates many of the risks. And when the challenges do arise, like I said about all the penalties, all the disclosures, and the breaches, they happen, and you do with them. Um, and but you do need to say that regular, meaningful assessments took place, and discussions took place with them. There's our lovely twins again, they came back in a couple of months after their birth, so they present in our garden. Setting boundaries, I just thought I'd put a little bit of extra in here. I realise we're getting a bit close to the end of the session, but um, we'll just talk about this. Setting boundaries is absolutely vital to ensuring our personal safety and well-being. Um, both Michelle and I have been through experiences that we've been overtired and had burnout. Um, so we've had to be quite strong in how we um, give that information to women, and not only to women, but to other people who use our unit. And, you know, they know that we're there and they're on call for the day. Sometimes it's just a little bit inappropriate. Somebody's texting you, texting with a little bit of an energy now. Some of the younger generation, they text you, you know, can I change my appointment for next Friday? And it's 10 o'clock on Sunday night. Um, and the best way to respond to that is just not to answer until you get to normal hours for next Friday. So you get that. The message? That was pretty close. Um, the priority for us, obviously, is for well, healthy, normal pregnancy, so we're both at London, and that equates to our family care. Any complications that require a birth at the hospital, necessitates women being connected to a midwife who lives locally to that in the car of birth or in the region. Um, if they require second repair, and that actually includes injections. I think a lot of midwives now are getting a bit blase about providing care and we get this switch around in the hospital. They shift between, oh, this is secondary, no, it's back to primary care and I'm actually not a believer in that. Nobody knows what's going to happen in an induction when we interfere with the normal process. An interference doesn't just mean with drugs and interference, it actually means with being in the woman's space and making that a place for her to be comfortable with her. You know, people coming in, opening doors, people doing monitoring. Well, all that is into this. All that is into saying with a, a low key pattern with a woman or partner to get into it today. It's very good. Um, really regular time. And this is one place I spend a lot of my time off. This is a beautiful lake called Lake Mazora. Um, this is Andrew and I spent a this one morning we woke up and it was frosty. We go out there just for an overnight camp. It's close enough to do that. Hope we can move on. Ongoing education. We do have a three-year rotating program in New Zealand that um, requires us to maintain our competencies to get our annual practice certificate. Um, we um, do that by having training with other midwives and health professionals. Um, we have government funded industry cover now available for rural midwives to attend training courses that are not in our local area. And, um, and I'm in charge of the in-house education that we run monthly at, at London. We have a regular staff meeting um, with all the nurses and, um, and all the midwives. And then following that, we usually have a little education session that runs, as well as um, we're very lucky that um, our neonatal resuscitation that we require to do every year, so women, um, the educators come up from thousands and do a lovely day in our unit using our equipment. And we have a lovely lady called Chris who um, just retired as a midwife but still does our CPR first and she is Michelle and I coming in. We just see Annie on the floor, one of our lovely nurses lives in the background, this isn't the lives at them. Um, they're good sessions. You know, we all get on well, we all have a bit of a laugh. Um, and we all have a great communication, makes our unit run really well. We have registered nurses who are on the roster. The roster when we have somebody coming into the unit and building, the roster kicks in and they do a building relationships with them. We all talk about scenarios that were difficult, like breastfeeding issues or. 
Phoenix are involved, paper staff, we've got GPs, um, the ambulance staff involved, and then of course we have our relationships with the hospital. Couriers, they're fantastic, we need to talk to them all the time, maintenance staff, management schools. We are, we talk to everybody. Thank God we're good schools as well. These are little beautiful twins, they slept like this for over four months. They um, thought them where they would sleep with it. <laughs> Administration is the bane of all our lives, paperwork. Um, and we're just noticing now the facility maintenance and compliance now. We have audits coming out of our ears. So we've got a campaign. An audit by one person should be enough. To. We've also started um, an audit now for breastfeeding assembly. And I absolutely understand the necessity for keeping track of what's going on. But for a small unit like us, we're paying six thousand dollars. But the BFHR people have come back up to the and say, yeah, you're doing great. So we're doing it. We earn all the money. Yeah, I'm blurred in there. I'll get off that one. It is getting more and more difficult to maintain. And, um, teamwork. Um, just putting this slide up here, this is Michelle and me swimming in Lake Tulana. We did a sponsored swim to raise money for our executive care. Unfortunately, our cover for the weekend fell through, so Michelle did the full distance. It was two kilometres across the lake. And I, put, I jumped in at the last third um, after I'd handed my cell phone to my son. So I wanted. Um, and for anybody who wants to know, yep, it's cold in there. It's 12 degrees on a good sunny day. But once you get going, we'll be fine. We're going to do it again next year. <laughs> yeah, and my son noted that I had the goggles on just a look. These are just some lovely pictures that I'm going to share with you now. Um, some of our lovely families. This is about the outside of our unit, we a little sun deck. These are the post rooms you can see. One, two, and two on the corner here. Uh -huh. This is Jane, one of our lovely nurses. The nurses are awesome. They order their breastfeeding um, education. They're fantastic women. They're all rural women. They can all cook. That's what they do for our women that cook food. Um, so that's going to the similar. Um, that was our Carmelta. Um, uh, she came along for the blessing of one of these days with Trinity Center. That was Tiffany and Bruce just digging the hole. The center, the profile tree that's planted there. Paula had had a second baby that was full of the GP of the shoulder of the next time. She just delivered that day and we were doing it and they decided to stay there for some distance. Yeah, we do have a laugh. This is Trish again, our beautiful um, facilitator for our CPR. Helen's coming behind her. Obviously Trish is coming with something very important. But Michelle's decided that the, the child dummy needs a little bit of distance there. Got sitting on the floor here just now, but myself not. Yep, get those socks off the baby. Families are involved, there's no set visiting hours. The fathers stay. The children usually come and visit with grandmas, bath babies, and children. Here's one of our postnatal rooms. Little bird. That's it in there. And that area there is just a garden with beautiful roses. In the background, you can just put the medical center in. You don't want to do that. I don't know. Is that all? Thank you, Anna. Yeah, I think that's the end of all the pictures. So, is there, is there any questions now? Um, <laughs> well, you're welcome, Sarah. Uh, is anybody got any questions? Hi, Nikki, it's Deb. I know um, you had worked in a 
uh, an urban centre before and a tertiary centre and now you've got the experience of this remote area. So I wonder what, what's been the biggest challenge that you've had to, to meet in making that transition? I think that, well I don't think it was a major challenge actually, Dave, I think what it's made very clear is that um, the difference between primary and secondary care. You know, we, you know, the women here um, have to travel a long way to secondary care, so that option of, oh well I'll just go and have an epidural if I don't make it, it kind of isn't there for them there, you know, and that makes it very clear for us, you know, it makes it a very clear differential between primary and secondary. I don't think it really was a challenge in, in my in your literacy still. I think it just hones them up a little bit. I have to say that, you know, having not done um, um, computer for a while, it was you know some of the questions they come out with send you scrambling back to ideal student advice or your or your textbook just to refresh yourself on that. But um, most of it really is is that lovely healthy woman checking in that they are just staying within those. Sometimes, you know, midwives in tertiary centres uh, look down on midwives in rural areas, but I'm always so impressed by the um, the strength of the skills that you need, and you highlighted that really well, Nikki, um, you know, talking about being able to identify the flags. I mean, you need really, really strong skills, I think, to work in a rural area. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Jenny. Nikki, you've got a couple of questions in the chat box. Just, um, someone mm -hmm. was asking, um, what's the rate of your transfer to secondary units? What's the what, sorry? What's the rate what of transfer? The rate of transfer? Um, well, the numbers last year for London, for instance, we, between Michelle and myself, a hundred women came through London. Some of those obviously were not booked with us, um, and some of them just came to postnatal care, but we were involved in 100 with uh, the women. We had um, 48 births at London last year. Out of the total booking, I think our numbers got to just over 60, 80 actual women booked with us, and, about, and then 40, 48 births at London. So yeah, 50%. Okay, and um, someone's asked, do you notice more women are breastfeeding when you finish with them at six weeks? Do we notice more women are breastfeeding? Hmm, look from ponds well, and under. Well, I have to say that our breastfeeding rates are nearly 100%. Um, it's just how it is. I don't, I don't know why we're so successful. We, um, I think it comes down to the... Um, the number of people they come in contact with giving them the same information. Like the nurses are so committed to it. Um, some women do choose to bottle feed. Um, and we don't, we don't um, make them feel bad about that. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, uh, women who choose to bottle feed, even then often will give the colostrum and then we show them, you know, we help them to make sure that they know what they're doing with the bottle. Yeah, our, our breastfeeding, it's not, a, it's not a big issue here. And I think the cost of formula puts a lot of people off. They, they're wanting now to use their own milk. It's just, um, yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm going to actually have to call it quits here because we are nearly up to 10 o'clock. But right. I just want to say thank you. I know. <laughs> And there's heaps of questions, so if you'd like to have a quick look at the chat box and answer some of them there. Is that a bit better? Okay, I could do that. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. That'd be better. And um, All right, I just want to say thank you for your stunning presentation and we love the photos. Um, mm -hmm. I've got my I've got my rural print, I've got my rural placement coming up, so I'm I'm really looking forward to it now. <laughs> Go you, you will enjoy it. It's, it is so it is pure midwifery. It is. Thank you, everybody. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself.